Does God exist? According to Hobbes. Welcome to the Summit Study Hall. I'm Dre, and that's the first question we're posing our new philosopher, Thomas Hobbes. Before we get into the quotes themselves, let's take a brief look at Hobbes' life and legacy. Thomas Hobbes was born in 1588 and lived until 1679. His primary theory was that all human action is motivated by selfish concerns, opposing Aristotle's view that man is a naturally social being. His great work on political science culminated in his crown achievement called Leviathan, which came out in 1651. While it attracted much controversy, it was still influential enough to last through the trials of time, and so we still learn from its pages today. So with that, let's dive right into our first quote. For as much as God Almighty is incomprehensible, it follows that we can have no conception or image of the deity, and consequently all his attributes signify our inability and defect of power to conceive anything concerning his nature, and not any conception of the same, excepting only this, that there is a God. For the effects we acknowledge naturally do necessarily include a power of their producing before they were produced, and that power presupposes something existent that has such power. And the thing so existing with power to produce, if it were not eternal, must needs have been produced by somewhat before it, and that again by something else before that, till we come to an eternal, that is to say, to the first power of all powers, and first cause of all causes. And this is it which all men call by the name of God, implying eternity incomprehensibility, and omnipotency. And thus all men that will consider may naturally know that God is, though not what he is, even as a man though born blind, though it be not possible for him to have any imagination what kind of thing is fire, yet he cannot but know that something there is that men call fire, because it warms him. The Elements of Law, Chapter 11.2 Though Hobbes was quite outspoken against the church on many issues, his belief in the existence of God cannot be overlooked. Here, Hobbes defines God as eternal incomprehensible, and omnipotent. If we are to believe in God, these are must-have qualities that a higher power rightly needs and deserves to have in order for creation to have occurred. For if anything named a higher power is not eternal, it surely must have been produced by something before it and so on and so forth, until we come to an eternal end, to the first power of all powers, and first cause of all causes. We can call this entity the unmoved mover, for there existed no cause before it. He plainly states as well that indeed there is a God. To have the boldness to make such an assumption 
based on feelings alone is not something unique to Hobbes. Many of us as well don't need overwhelming proof of a higher power to perceive one working in our lives. Perhaps our spiritual makeup, once accepting God as a definite being, affects our very nature, and thereby we can attribute our reborn selves as the only proof we need that he in fact does exist. Hobbes also uses, quite elegantly, an example of fire having the ability to warm all people, even those born blind. And so, through that warmth, they too can know that it indeed exists, whether they've ever physically seen it or not. Quote number two. The true God may be personated, as he was first by Moses, who governed the Israelites, that were not his, but God's people, not in his own name, with hoc dissit Moses, but in God's name, with hoc dissit Dominus. Secondly, by the Son of Man, his own Son, our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ, that came to induce all nations into the kingdom of his Father, not as of himself, but as sent from his Father. And thirdly, by the Holy Ghost, or Comforter, speaking and working in the Apostles, which Holy Ghost was a Comforter that came not of himself, but was sent and proceeded from them both. Leviathan, Part 1, Chapter 16 We can affirm Hobbes' belief in God from the first three words of this passage. As short and simple as they may be, they carry all the weight in the world. The true God. He goes on to specifically explain in detail the Holy Trinity and how God exists in three heavenly bodies, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is a Christian belief, and we can thusly attribute Hobbes' theological ideas to Christianity itself. To also name Jesus Christ as our blessed Savior is to outright announce one's acceptance of the Bible's claim that he is, in fact, God's only begotten Son. That he allowed himself to experience all of the everyday feelings of man and for the Creator to quite literally become his creation is to be able to safely call him our blessed Savior indeed. And with those two quotes put aside for now, we can come to the conclusion that Hobbes indeed believed in the existence of God and that of the Holy Trinity. Though his stance on many theological issues have led to different opinions, from what we can gather here, his views on Christianity's core doctrines remain firmly intact. So with that said, thank you for listening to another installment as we begin with the new philosopher's thoughts and ideas to our five main questions. Until tomorrow, my prayers, like always, are for God to bless us all. Indeed. Take care. Fate or free will, according to Hobbes. Welcome to the Summit Study Hall. I'm Dre, and that's the second question of our series, which we're posing to Renaissance thinker Thomas Hobbes today. We won't waste any time, so let's get right into it 
with our first quote. And this whole controversy concerning the predestination of God and the free will of man is not peculiar to Christian men. For we have huge volumes of this subject under the name of fate and contingency, disputed between the Epicureans and the Stoics, and consequently, it is not a matter of faith, but of philosophy. The Elements of Law, Chapter 6.9 When Hobbes writes that the free will of man is not a matter of faith, but of philosophy, we can imagine that he means faith has already proved it so, and that it's now upon the shoulders of philosophy to further prove its validity. There exist many things which people accept as firm truth based solely on faith alone, and oftentimes their holes and flaws are exposed through the use of philosophy. But when it comes to such fluid matters as free will, predestination, and the like, it's not so easy to prove or disprove them using only faith-based rationale or philosophical logic. Here, however, Hobbes is perhaps saying that philosophy can account for such questions in a deeper way than faith alone can, and maybe even all the questions concerning any other point as well, as he states later on in the quote. This brings up a wider point, that there are many theories which can be disproven using logic and philosophical insight, as we've just mentioned. However, when it does come to matters of faith, it truly comes down to each individual person as to what their bottom lines are concerning any of these deeper questions. Depending on the question itself, philosophy can only go so far before faith has to take over. And conversely, the same is true of the opposite as well. Quote number two. Lastly, from the use of the word free will, no liberty can be inferred to the will, desire, or inclination, but the liberty of the man, which consists in this, that he finds no stop in doing what he has the will, desire, or inclination to do. Leviathan, Part 2, Chapter 21 Though shrouded in a bit of confusion, we can come to understand this passage as saying that once humankind discovers that it indeed has free will, there will be no reason to put an end to our willful wants and needs. By realizing that there is, in fact, freedom in our day-to-day -day choices, it gives us the ability to choose them with the firm belief that they are indeed of our own choosing. Perhaps knowing and accepting that all we do is of our own free will actually makes the act that much more meaningful. To buy flowers for a sweetheart, or to give charitably to those in need. These types of things are all the more powerful when done from a willful and cheerful heart. So where does Hobbes stand on free will? He most likely agrees that we do in fact have it. What we do with it, however, is up to each and every one of us individually. And based on his philosophy, our motivations aren't always with the best of intentions, as he advocates for a human nature driven solely by selfish means. 
this doesn't negate free will. And it shouldn't put a damper on the fact that we have it to begin with. Maybe the more aware we are of our motivations, the more pure our actions can become. Free will is ultimately a gift, and we should view it as such, cherishing it, using it, and above all, respecting it. So with that, we'll begin wrapping up this installment and just be grateful that we're able to even have discussions on free will in the first place, that our minds can step back and ask such questions. That, in itself, may be the key to fully realizing we do, in fact, have it. Until tomorrow, my prayers, like always, are for God to bless us all. Indeed. Take care. Why does evil exist? According to Hobbes. Welcome to the Summit Study Hall. I'm Dre, and that's the question of the moment, which we'll be tackling in tonight's installment. It's always a complex topic of discussion, and though nobody can answer it with full certainty, we are blessed to be given the freedom to unravel its entanglement within our lives. So let's not waste any time and get right into it. But whatsoever is the object of any man's appetite or desire, that is it which he for his part calls good, and the object of his hate and aversion, evil, and of his contempt, vile and inconsiderable. For these words of good, evil, and contemptible are ever used with relation to the person that uses them. There being nothing simply and absolutely so, nor any common rule of good and evil to be taken from the nature of the objects themselves, but from the person of the man, where there is no commonwealth, or in a commonwealth, from the person that represents it, or from an arbitrator or judge, whom men disagreeing shall by consent set up and make his sentence the rule thereof. Leviathan, Part 1, Chapter 6 To call something good or evil is a subjective label or so it seems from this passage. Perhaps two people can see the same situation from different vantage points, and each call it something different, and both be right in the process. It truly is up to each of us to consider what is morally right or wrong. And even though we have societal influences which help us determine and come to those types of conclusions. At the end of the day, it really is for ourselves to determine where the center of our moral compass sits. Quote number two. And first, it is peculiar to the nature of man to be inquisitive into the causes of the events they see some more, some less, but all men so much as to be curious in the search of the causes of their own good and evil fortune. Leviathan, Part 1, Chapter 12 We can all imagine how someone's fortune may be deemed good. But what about evil? Is it just another way of saying that things didn't turn out the way we intended them to? So we deem the fortune evil in the process? 
in this sense, evil may be a term encompassing all that is undesirable. To come back to our main question then, why does evil exist in the first place? Why do certain events turn out undesirable and others to our liking? It seems like a useless question to look into why everything doesn't just happen as we'd like for all of us. It perhaps comes back to free will, karma, cause and effect. All of these and so many more things must surely work together when we look to certain events in our lives. One thing we can be sure of, even when it seems unlikely, is that all things do work together for our good. Whether specific circumstances tear us down or lead us to sadness, at our journey's end, everything that's ever happened will more than likely unite to create a piece of art that's beyond imagination. Quote number three. From the very creation, God not only reigned over all men naturally by his might, but also had peculiar subjects whom he commanded by a voice as one man speaks to another in which manner he reigned over Adam and gave him commandment to abstain from the tree of cognizance of good and evil, which when he obeyed not, but tasting thereof, took upon him to be as God, judging between good and evil, not by his creator's commandment, but by his own sense. His punishment was a privation of the estate of eternal life, wherein God had at first created him. Leviathan, Part 3, Chapter 35 This really furthers from our previous point as to whether or not we each consider individual acts to be good or evil. For Adam, in the above example, it wasn't evil for him to eat the apple of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he did. Even though it went against an explicit command to stay away from it at all costs by his very creator. This speaks to our own judgments and how we deal with authoritative instructions when we believe that we know what's best for our own individual selves instead of listening to sound advice, especially when it's given to us from God. It seems short-sighted to contradict our own creator in the aim of getting what we want out of a situation. But that's how many of us operate on a day-to-day basis. We go against the grain, against that inner voice telling us that it's not the right path to take, though we take it anyway. Perhaps Hobbes is pointing out here that we need to learn from our previous mistakes. Even if they were made through our ancestors thousands of years ago. Therefore, Evil is not so much an objective quality, but a subjective one, which we ascribe to certain objects and situations. However, when an authoritative entity overrides our own individual ability to judge well, we should take heed and listen to its sound advice. So with that taken into consideration, we can say that Hobbes' stance on why evil exists comes from our inability to properly judge our own actions. Perhaps what could remedy such a problem is to, in fact, learn from past mistakes. 
not only just from our own, but from humankind's as well. As is attributed to Churchill, the saying, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it, may very well apply here. And with that, we bring this installment to an end. The question of evil may perhaps never be fully answered, but like we've stated before, the more opinions on it we do have, the more we may be able to steer away from it altogether. Until tomorrow, my prayers, like always, are for God to bless us all. Indeed, take care. What is beauty? According to Hobbes. Welcome to the Summit Study Hall. My name is Dre, and that's what we're tackling in today's installment. Like always, beauty is an incredibly subjective topic, but one that is essential if we are to appreciate the better things in life. Whether it be an experience, an object, or a feeling, we are ultimately free to decide for ourselves what does and doesn't deserve to be termed beautiful. With that said, let's not waste any time and get right into our first quote. Ignorance of the signification of words, which is want of understanding, disposes men to take on trust. Not only the truth they know not, but also the errors, and which is more, the nonsense of them they trust. For neither error nor nonsense can without a perfect understanding of words be detected. Leviathan, Part 1, Chapter 11 While this doesn't necessarily speak on beauty itself, it does make the case for clarity and a knowledge of the artwork's individual parts. In this example, Hobbes uses words themselves. Without the ability to know what each means and its implications, we are at a loss as to what the sentence is trying to say, and by extension, the person who wrote it. This can be applied to various art forms, and thus a commentary on beauty can be formed. When we know and appreciate every color and what it symbolizes on a painted canvas, the work means all the more to us. When we know what angles and movements are used in the filming of a movie, we can learn that much more from the storyline and see how it all works together to say what it wants to say. Therefore, beauty is the understanding of an object's individual parts and the artist's own clarity towards conveying them to the audience. This also speaks to the artist themselves. Their use of the different shades and tones which any given work of art is used to create. It seems that the more versed someone is in their field, or the more rules, quote unquote, they know, the more fluidly they can break them and make new ones in the process, thus leaving their own individual mark on whichever medium they ultimately chose to work with. Quote number two. All that is necessary to salvation is contained in two virtues, faith in Christ and obedience to laws. The latter of these, if it were perfect, were enough to us, 
But because we are all guilty of disobedience to God's law, not only originally in Adam, but also actually by our own transgressions, there is required at our hands now not only obedience for the rest of our time, but also a remission of sins for the time past, which remission is the reward of our faith in Christ. That nothing else is necessarily required to salvation is manifest from this, that the kingdom of heaven is shut to none but to sinners, that is to say, to the disobedient or transgressors of the law, nor to them in case they repent and believe all the articles of Christian faith necessary to salvation. Leviathan, Part 3, Chapter 43 Again, not a direct comment on beauty, but an important piece of advice on the beauty of simplicity. Hobbes begins this passage with an explanation of what is all that is necessary to salvation. Using salvation as an example, then, we can conclude that the quickest way to something so deep and consequential is through faith in Christ and obedience to the laws. While it may not seem as simple as that to many people, Hobbes is clearly stating that that's his belief, and one which many others can agree with. If we can connect this passage to our previous one, we can see where clarity begins to show itself vitally important, especially when our eternal souls are on the line. Make something too complicated, and it loses its initial audience. Make it simple enough for anyone to understand, and anyone will be able to then understand it, which should be the aim of all art and beauty in the first place. So with that, we can begin closing out the specific installment. And just take comfort in the fact that just because something seems to be simple on its surface doesn't make it any less beautiful in the long run. Perhaps, in many cases, it makes it even more compelling than the complicated alternatives found in all art and expression. Until tomorrow, my prayers, like always, are for God to bless us all. Indeed, take care. How does time move? According to Hobbes. Welcome to the Summit Study Hall. I'm Dre, and that's, of course, the last question we're asking our Renaissance philosopher for his series. It's always an in-depth one, so let's not waste any time and get right into it. The present only has a being in nature. Things past have a being in the memory only. But things to come have no being at all. The future being but a fiction of the mind. Applying the sequels of actions past to the actions that are present, which with most certainty is done by him that has most experience, but not with certainty enough. And though it be called prudence when the event answers our expectation, yet in its own nature, it is but presumption, 
for the foresight of things to come, which is providence, belongs only to him by whose will they are to come. Leviathan, Part 1, Chapter 3 For Hobbes, and according to this passage, time is in the present only, and the future does not exist at all. That's not to say that there will be no future, but that from the present standpoint, it is a fiction of the mind, and that we shouldn't think of it in real terms until it actually happens. Further, Hobbes speaks on trying to predict the future, in a certain sense, by taking what's already happened, the past, and applying that to what's currently taking place, the present. Based on those facts, we can then make assumptions towards what awaits us in terms of providence. Quote number two. Anxiety for the future time disposes men to inquire into the causes of things because the knowledge of them makes men the better able to order the present to their best advantage. Leviathan, Part 1, Chapter 11 Take, for example, the person going to court on unfounded charges. They may look into the way other cases similar to theirs were resolved as a cause of their present situation to better themselves for a future event, thereby ordering the present to their best advantage, if not the future as well. That's just one instance of the rationale of this passage but it basically comes down to taking all the information we've already experienced and gone through and looking at the root cause of our present circumstances so that we may be better equipped for what awaits us in our futures. This sounds like something most, if not all of us, do on a subconscious level to some extent. We've already experienced certain situations in the past and know what may await us if they are to repeat. Another example may be the hot stove. We've accidentally burned ourselves before on its surface, so we know what would happen if we were to forgetfully burn ourselves again. The theory furthers from our previous point as to the fact that the future, since it hasn't happened yet, is still undecided and can still change depending upon our individual actions and choices. Quote number three. No man can have in his mind a conception of the future. For the future is not yet but of our conceptions of the past, we make a future, or rather call past future relatively. Thus, after a man has been accustomed to see like antecedents, followed by like consequence, whensoever he sees the like come to pass to anything he had seen before, he looks there, should follow it the same than followed then. As for example, because a man has often seen offenses followed by punishment, when he sees an offense in present, he thinks punishment to be consequent thereto. But consequent unto that which is present, men call future. And thus, we make remembrance to be provision 
or conjecture of things to come, or expectation or presumption of the future. The Elements of Law, Chapter 4.7 This again flows from our previous point extremely nicely, as it solidifies Hobbes' theory on the fact that we use our past experiences to be able to decode future occurrences. He is blunt in his assumption that the future is not yet. And regardless if we are to take on the eternalist role or not, we can all agree that something being called the future is therefore not yet the present whether or not it already exists in some future period further along in our individual timelines. So, how does time move according to Hobbes? It is very much opposite to eternalism, in the sense that the present is all we have. The past is memory, and the future is not yet known, so neither truly exist. We may as well use the information we have up until this point to best guess what will still be. And even then, it's up to providence itself as to whether or not we're truly right in our assumptions. So that'll do it for tonight. Thank you for sticking it out through another series of questions as we prepare to run through them again with our next Renaissance philosopher, who may be a little bit better known than the others, Rene Descartes. Until tomorrow, my prayers, like always, are for God to bless us all. Indeed. Take care.